welcome to, I guess, another uh, Utani live stream. And today I've actually got Connor Carlson from Prometheus by Minute with me. So hi, Connor. Hi. So this is going to be a bit of an experiment. We do not know how the technology is going to react in regards to the stream. So I apologize if there is any lag or something like that but we're gonna we're gonna try this out and see if it works if it doesn't it doesn't that's okay i'm sure connor would love to do this again <laughs> all right so as you know oh, i did not mute <laughs> i had twitch in the background oh okay i've um i've got a list of characters here in front of me so for people who are following at home especially if you've got the alien uh, scripts from AVP Galaxy, you may notice that you've got some pages missing. All right. Uh, Connor, would you like to take over and explain what you experienced in this? Yeah, so I... Weirdly, this script isn't that easy to get your hands on. Most of the other ones are. But uh, So I originally read this whole thing in one sitting. It was uh, on the dailyscript.com. So it was just one continuous uh, HTML document. Uh, so not being a PDF, there's no page numbers, so I asked you, oh, do you have a PDF? So we, I just know where we're reading from and to. And then I was going through that one, just taking notes. And, uh, yeah, it went from page 39 to 49 for some reason. So you miss out on the face hugger scene, which is kind of important. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so yeah. yeah. It, it, it kind of... Um... Yeah, it, it, this is an, an entire, entire section, section, which I should have noticed, noticed because, because I, know I know for a fact, fact that, that um, sorry, sorry, I had, I had some settings set to change. change. Uh, I, I know, know for a fact, fact that, that there were some, some pieces, pieces where um, um, we've got the art of the face hugger on top, on top of, of the character, character. kind of looks like a mini trilobite, and I didn't notice it missing, but I've seen it online, so I don't know why it didn't register all the times that I've read the script when I had it printed out. It kind of flows fairly okay. It's almost like they just cut a whole scene out, so it's not like you're jumping in mid-sentence or anything. Mm. But we've got um, the scripts online. Um, I've saved it, so what I can do is I can publish it to the blog right now, or, um, or we can paste a copy of the link to the script. But they may, may not know where we're up to, so let me just... <laughs> Update the blog. Sorry about my typing, guys. I know you hate the mechanical keyboard. <laughs> There we go. Yeah, mine, you just hear the thuds. <laughs> okay, so let me just post that now. Oh, maybe I should put the link to Twitch. how organized I am. <laughs> and as usual, I'll be posting a copy of this to YouTube later, so we can see my failures twice. <laughs> All right. So... <clears throat> We're going to approach this in a different way because we've got two of us here. Um, I'm going to read the parts of uh, Martin, Roby, and Dal Brassard because those are supposed to be uh, Ripley and Lambert. And Connor will be everyone else. <laughs> so <laughs> lots of pressure here. Um, and, and we're going to do it in a very similar format. Bust out my voice acting skills. <laughs> At least you've got voice acting skills, I don't. <laughs> I realised yeah, I'd applied for a part recently, and I was like, I can't do anything but mother. <laughs> yeah, 
I, uh, I, I'm told that my shawl is a bit too uncanny, so... Really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know, cause, uh, let's see. It's what I choose to believe. It's like a kind of a bad, overdone British accent, and then, I don't know, the, you do a feminine voice that's a little higher, a little softer, breathier, that's, that's how I do it. And then my Holloway is kind of loosened up and a little bit of a douchebag, so... <laughs> Uh, definitely suits the character. Yeah, I, I, and he's from uh, Logan. is is from New York, so it's not that traditional, rhotic American accent. It's a little bit more. Well, New York, New Jersey, and a lot of areas around there, it's less rhotic. Mm-hmm. So I keep ha- when I'm recording, I keep going, don't hit those R's so hard. It's a little, a little less. <laughs> All right. Um. So, so when we, we read, read through the script, script like before, before, I was reading through and then we'd pause it whenever we had a point to talk about. And, and that's the way we're going to structure it today. But obviously me and Connor are going to be taking turns. So bear with us if there's a few hiccups in remembering whose line is whose. <laughs> whose line is it anyway? Mm, so I'm uh, Roby and Brassard. Um, Connor will be a standard Melconis. Hunter, Hunter and, and Faust, and we'll, we'll hopefully be reading, reading the descriptions of what our characters are doing ourselves. ourselves. So, so yeah, yeah, page thirty-one. Let's um, let's, let's go, go ahead. ahead. All right. Still worried. Oh well, you know me. I've always respected your opinion, Martin. If something worries you, it worries me. Roby reaches over and changes the slide to one of the crudely drawn triangles on the alien control panel. What would you say that was supposed to mean? Well, it's obviously intentional, some kind of attempt at communication. Maybe it's a symbol that means something to them. But why draw it on the wall? Roby switches off the projector, sits up and rubs his face wearily. He rises and goes to the coffee machine. Uh, I just want to pause it right there. So what I think that this section is, is when Shaw is in Prometheus and she is reviewing the video of the engineer falling down and having his head chopped off by the wall. Yes. And it's Holloway coming in and having this conversation. She is trying to figure out why did they die? Um, So yeah, it's really interesting how they reuse that sort of situation uh, mm. that was in the original script in the Prometheus movie and I think that section worked quite well yeah it, it's very much serving the same function in the story and in the final script of Alien there isn't that curiosity and this is one of the fundamental differences uh, and maybe I can kind of see where Oban is coming from here where he envisioned it as this more optimistic world, I feel, where these people actually are genuinely curious, have a scientific curiosity, and want to investigate this place. Whereas in Alien, the final version, it's much more cynical. Um, There's a corporate financial aspect. Everyone's talking about the bonus situation and uh, bitching about this interruption to their scheduled assignment or mission so really the only character that shows any real interest or curiosity is ash and um oh cool blanking on names now um john hurt uh kane there we go oh yeah so that's sandy malconis in our script (laughs) Mm. Um, present here but yes yeah so I guess as well, because they're trying to figure out what the symbol meant, whereas in Prometheus they already know what the now, symbols mean, because they're there. The triangle, uh, that's actually got me thinking that would a geometric shape be... Well, is geometry true, I guess is what I'm trying to say here, is what would... A, an advanced civilization need with shapes. It, it, it doesn't recur in nature, so what are the odds that they think of shapes the same way we do and build buildings the same way and 
draw triangles the same way. Yeah, because they're right now um, in the alien ship. Are they in the pyramid already? Because, or is it saying go through the pyramid? Because I'm pretty yeah. sure. Yeah. I'm pretty it's sure. On. There are ex it's, it's a, a separate external thing in this script. Yeah, so there's the derelict, and then there's the pyramid, and this, this space jockey's an asshole who's <laughs> making it seem like he wants you to go to the pyramid, but no, that's that's the exact opposite of what he's trying to say. That said, I don't want to deviate too much, but it's relevant. There's a there's I've seen a few articles and videos discussing long-term semiotics, so. Um, when it comes to disposing of nuclear waste, there are um, dumping sites, so they'll bury these nuclear things deep, deep underground, and there's all these fences and signs around, you know, the skull and crossbones signs and what have you. Now, to us in the 21st century, the meaning's perfectly clear, but there's this real serious debate of well, uh, how would a, a far distant civilization interpret that? I mean, we might not even be talking about human beings, you know, what if it's some, yeah, aliens or some, I don't know, Planet of the Apes type situation? I mean, I'm, I'm getting off, of course, the imagination is getting the better of me, but the point is, we will not always perceive reality the way we do now, and symbols can change. So if a future generation comes across a skull and crossbones, they might think this is a, a grave site. They might start digging it up, hoping to find uh, skeletons and other archaeological records, and then, you know, basically uh, kill themselves and anyone within a few kilometers. <laughs> that, <laughs> that would be, be a horrible irony, irony but, but in, in that, that case, case, it, it kind, kind of makes sense, sense with um, the. the, the, the the way, the way they've, they've portrayed, portrayed the signal or, or the sign in uh, Prometheus, saying, "Yeah, that's what it I... says, go there, but maybe, maybe it's saying, saying don't, don't go there. <laughs> yeah, I think, well, that's where my brain went when I read all those discussions and just go, oh, yeah, it's not, the, it's not necessarily that these engineers were luring you in. They were making the message totally clear from their perspective. It's just that we don't interpret things the same way. Um, kind of and, like the beacon, I guess, I guess in, that, that appears in just about all the alien, alien films, films that, that they, they think, think it's a yeah. distress beacon, beacon but it might be a fuck off, don't come here beacon. Um, they may as well just not have made any sort of sign. You know, if you want to attract their attention, make a sign. If you don't, don't make a sign. But um, the other, oh, the other solution that people were thinking of is make it this almost. Um, religious thing that you're you're passing down information from one generation to the other so you have like the keepers of the nuclear information or whatever and so ritualistically they say statistically that is the best way for information to survive uh, we can look at a lot of um uh, like aboriginal tribes australian aborigines or native americans that they have a really good and really long memory which we can confirm thanks to uh you know like natural disasters and stuff like they might have a dream time story about a flood through a cave oh look there's that flood and it uh, there's that cave and it was flooded at somewhere around this time that they're saying it was so yeah in this case this particular space jockey i suppose we should call him he's doing his best he didn't really have a lot to work with here yeah <laughs> uh poor guy anyway, anyway let's, let's get, get back, back to it, it. Get back on track. This is what I do for Prometheus by a minute. Just talk about the historical and scientific stuff and not actually focus on the movie itself. <laughs> it's, it's fun, fun though. I enjoy it. it. It's pretty good. Okay. So, uh, this is Roby doing these things. He rises and goes... Get... Sorry. He rises and goes to the coffee machine, picking a hair out of the coffee pot. This ship is full of cat hair. Tell you what, Martin, as soon as the engine's fixed, beep, the communicator interrupts standard. He leans across and presses a button. This is Chaz. Uh, Brassard, over, filtered. Chaz, uh, this is Dell. Can you come topside for a minute? What's up? Uh, Brassard again. 
Well, the sun just came up again, and it seems the wind's died down. It's as clear as a bell outside. There's something I think you might want to see. I'm on my way. He and Roby head for the door. I hate the word ought. <laughs> In the script it says you ought to see, but I just have such a hesitation. I, it's a, I hate that word. Ought and worst, ought not, or oughtn't. <laughs> ought is I've never heard of it used that way. I heard that once in a Doctor Who episode, and I think my skin actually turned inside out because I cringed so hard. (laughs) Oh, must be very uncomfortable. I have the same reaction to some words, but I'm I'm not going to tell anyone my weaknesses. No, exactly. uh, (laughs) What an idiot. I've revealed my weaknesses. But, uh, yeah, that sort of misophonia, I think, is is probably connected to that. (laughs) Uh, He and Roby head for the door. Uh, interior bridge deck. Uh, hold on a sec. I think mm-hmm. I'm supposed to say Brassard stuff because Brassard's the navigator. Ah. Oh. There we go. That's all right. I can take over from now. Okay. Uh, Brassard is alone in the control Stop. room. He's got an English accent and he's a little bit like, um... <laughs> oh, fuck. Oh, God. <laughs> What's that actor's name? Uh... He voiced uh, Wheatley in, in Portal. Wheatley. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't I think, think I can do <laughs> We'll see, we'll see. I might butcher it. Just um... <laughs> generic British accent will work. There you go. Brassard is alone in the control room when Standard and Roby arrive. What is it? Take a look. Exterior. Ship. Day. That's how you got to say it on Prometheus by a minute. <laughs> <laughs> the dust no longer blows. The day is crisp, clear, and silent. Interior. Bridge. Day. I was was scanning the horizon horizon to see what I could pick up. Look Look there. there. On On that that screen. screen. What is it? I can't... Blip. (laughs) Brassard (laughs) Brassard enlarges the image. The screen now shows a tapering stone pyramid on the horizon. They all stare at the image for a long moment. The silhouette of the pyramid is instantly suggestive of the scroll triangle in the alien ship. I just want to hold this up to the camera so that people following at home can, can see. So that's the pyramid there. It's pretty cool. I like that he included illustrations. That's a bit of fun. Yeah, it's, it's good for people who don't have an imagination. <laughs> no offense, people out there with no imagination. Right. It's called uh, aphantasia, I believe. It's a real condition. We shouldn't be uh, judging. Ableism. <laughs> so, standard presses the nearest communicator and speaks into the grill. So that should have been your line. Sorry. <laughs> standard presses the nearest communicator and speaks into the grill. This is Chaz. All hands topside. Now, interior bridge day. A little later. Anyone, I guess. Uh, angle on a view screen. It shows the pyramid on the horizon. Camera pulls back to reveal all the men sitting and standing around the room. Doesn't see much doubt about it. Yep. Doesn't see much doubt about it, does there? Next one's yours too. Yep, it's mine. Um, no cones. Uh, 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 what are we going to do with that one? Um, yeah. It's supposed to be like Kane. So he's supposed to sound stoned, I think. All right. Um... <laughs> No, I'm not going to do that voice. Um, <laughs> my bad sort of pseudo Bob Dylan-esque voice. You should I, do I, your, um, what's, what's it, is it, it? uh, Fifield? Oh, my Fifield, yeah. 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 Fine. Okay. That creature must have considered it important, using his last strength to draw it. Maybe, Maybe they, they built, built it. it. As what? A marker for buried instrumentation? Or a mass grave. Let's pause that right there. <laughs> so we've passed this point in Prometheus by minute as well. When he's like, this looks like, the, sorry, this looks like a Holocaust painting. Yes. So, yeah, this is basically it. <laughs> this is it. This is the part where they mention it. <laughs> it is quite fun to go, well, there's all these elements here, but the characters and, and how it all plays out is different, but... The essential pieces are still there, and I, 
I'm fascinated by the evolution of a story. As someone who aspires to write fiction, I've never really finished anything yet, but uh, I'm working on it. Um, yeah, just seeing how uh, you start with an idea and then you end with this totally different concept. That's quite fascinating to me. Yeah, it's really cool that they've, they've, they've brought it back in, in not so many words. Uh, okay, let's continue. I, I'm beside, so I'm next. Yes. Maybe the rest of the crew is in there. Some kind of suspended animation waiting to be rescued. I like that, because that, uh, I mean, it's basically what happens with the engineers <laughs> in the Prometheus. Yeah! Is that there is one waiting to be rescued. It's also one of those lines that, even if it doesn't culminate anything, it gets the audience's imagination going, and they think, ooh, are we going to see some more aliens? Where What's going to happen? You, you've got this, you've put a plate up in the air. It's like, oh, you know, but this could culminate in something, maybe, maybe not, but... You, especially when you're watching a movie for the first time, you've got the wheels turning, you're thinking, ah, oh, there's this bit of information, and there's that, and so you can sort of solve the mystery. So I I try not to, not to get off too off tangent here, but um, yeah, when watching a movie, I just try and just switch my brain off and not try and think ahead. And then if I do, that means the movie's pretty bad, because I'm thinking <laughs> ahead of it. I make it a game, trying to mm. guess what happens next, and I was pleasantly surprised to not be able to guess anything in Prometheus. Despite having yeah, known about the script. <laughs> yeah, both Alien prequels did not see those endings coming. The, the essential details are the same structure. Like every single, especially the Ridley Scott Alien movies, follow a similar premise. But no, I was, I was very shocked and surprised. <laughs> All right. Uh, next part is you, by the way. Uh, oh, yes, because it's, yeah. Um... It wasn't necessarily built by them. On the, on the screen. screen oh, yeah. <laughs> like, do, do I do that? Because it's not about it. On the screen, a puff of dust blows in front of the pyramid. Roby, Roby says, says, Here, here comes, comes the dust, dust again. again. Exterior, ship, day. With a shriek, the dust storm returns, completely obscuring the snark, which is the worst name for a ship. Uh, for, uh, for people, people who haven't been following the other live, live streams, streams, the snark is the Nostromo, and that was the original name for the ship. Uh, Dan O'Bannon's <laughs> really shit at names. Chaz <laughs> Standard, captain of the snark. <laughs> well... <Okay. laughs> God, did he have any kids? What did he name his kids? Um, I don't think he had any. Good. <laughs> They probably would have ended up with horrendous names. You think celebrity names are bad now? <laughs> he would have just been like, oh, um... I'm sure Lamb Diane would have, would have stopped, stopped him. him. <laughs> yeah, and, um... Foam Board is the name of my son. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh... Oh, yes. Interior Bridge Day. Standard. Well, does anyone else agree with Martin that we should not explore it? Everyone looks around the room, but no one volunteers. Then the sooner we get moving, the better. Exterior, planetoid, day. Long shot of the stone pyramid, dust blowing in front of it. It is a crumbling, ancient edifice made of eroded grey stones, windowless tapering toward the top. Standard, Brostard and Melconis, wearing the protective suits, approach the pyramid. As they draw near, it becomes clear that the pyramid is roughly 50 feet tall. Standard. We can make out any details or features yet, but it's definitely too regular for natural formation. Interior. Bridge. Day. Ruby and Hunter are present. They are listening to Standard's voice on the radio. Don't know why that's capitalized, but there we go. Standard. Continued. Over the radio. There is one thing I can say for sure, though. Buzz, the uh, standard voice, is drowned out by static. Roby says, Now what's wrong? Hunter, I've completely lost their signal. Roby says, Can you get them back? I'm trying. 
Exterior, base of Pyramid Day. The three men come to the base of the massive structure. Dust and sand have piled thickly around the crumbling grey stones that form the base. Melconis, this looks ancient. Can't tell. These weather conditions could erode anything fast. They walk around the base. There's no entrance. Maybe the entrance is buried. Could be under our feet. Maybe there is no entrance. The thing may be solid. Interior, bridge, day. Roby says, Well, there ought to be. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I saw your eyes go really wide just then. <laughs> oh, I was just rubbing my eye out. I've got to try to subtly get an eyelash out there. There we go. Alright. Uh, there, there ought to be, be some, some way, way we can get, get through, through to them. them. The intercom beeps. Faust's voice is heard. Uh, you I'm trying to remember. No, Faust was very British. Okay. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but I'm gonna charge up the engines for a minute, okay? Roby says, says, Yeah, okay, okay go, go ahead. ahead. A loud, powerful throbbing begins, drowning out all of the sounds the engines are tested. A light on Roby, Roby's panel is flashing. We can see that it is the computer alert. Irritably, Ruby switches, uh, throws the switch. Uh, yes! <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do the voice of the computer. That's what you're made for. <laughs> yeah, I know. Now I have to like think of like the computer voice. Do you want to play a game? <laughs> I have temporary. I'm sorry. I have That's a little bit like the <laughs> the original series Star Trek robot voice a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I have temporary sequence on the monitor. Uh, hold it. I can't hear a I can't hear a damn thing. He puts an earphone to his ear and switches the computer's voice over. Go ahead. There is a pause while Roby listens to the computer. His eyes widen. You mean you've translated it? Another pause as he listens to the earphone. Well, come on. Come on. What does it say? Another pause. Roby's face changes. He looks chilled to the bone. His mouth works. Abruptly, engines shut off, leaving a ringing silence. Okay, we could pause there for uh, the translation thing i mentioned to you in in chat before that this retroactively works really well into continuity because ordinarily you just go well how the hell would this ship just translate a language that it has no frame of reference for it's a totally alien language there's no uh, root dialects to extract from but well if this is a, well, if we consider it as an alien sequel, then by Prometheus, they already know how to translate the engineer language. They've got that on file. Uh, go. It can translate it. Yeah. Uh, you know, David has been studying the language for... Or, or, like, uh, it wasn't even that particular language, but he's been studying all the, these different root languages for the years that the Prometheus was travelling. It just it happens, happens to be the lessons, lessons that, that we saw were, were the ones uh, that were used in the movie. So it was really interesting how he kind of said he dissected all of the uh, human languages to the root core. So that's why he's learned Proto-Indo-European, which is the base root language for well, where everything had come from originally. Yeah, and uh, I'll see if I can dig up. Uh, the article on it, I, I know I mentioned it in Prometheus by a minute ages ago, but they were able to make a, or sort of have a guess at the languages that preceded Pi Proto Indo European just by going, well, okay, this was the etymology, this is how it flowed forward through time, so how do we go backward and extrapolate how the language may have originated before getting to a record of? And a lot of people are fascinated by this, and I'm no exception. The idea of what was the very first spoken language? When did we go from a species that, you know, could communicate about as well as maybe, uh, you know, our ape relatives can? It's not 
complicated verbal language, but they've got body language, they've got some vocalizations. When did we go from that to an actual developed language, and how did that change us and how we perceive reality, how we communicate and relate it to other people? That that blows my mind. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's really it's cool, cool how they've, they've kind, kind of... of worked this all in it's just a very very small small fraction fraction, but but it's very very clever clever to to kind of use it as a tool to as a reason reason to go to the planet planet. and a reason to seek out the signal i mean both in terms of um this alien script and prometheus just how these just a single line of dialogue can really get your imagination going oh okay well then this means that and oh but but how does this tie to this? And yeah, I, that's the kind of analysis I live for. <laughs> All, right, All right, let's continue. continue. Uh, uh, your line. Why did I? Well, now, why did I do that? Okay, so <laughs> it's Hunter uh, looking over at Roby. Uh, what, what was that? The computer just, just translated, translated the goddamn, goddamn message. message. It's, it's not, not an SOS. SOS. It was a warning. A warning. <laughs> Uh, which I think is one of the best twists. Not a message, in... an invitation. <laughs> yeah, one of the best twists in, in cinema history. It's it's not one of the big famous ones like Luke, I am your father, or Rosebud, or whatever. But it's not a it's not a warning. It's it's uh, it's not a, a SOS. It's a it's a warning in Alien and also in Prometheus. Like that's that's cool. That's <laughs> just like oh shit. <laughs> yeah, I love it. It's good. <laughs> it really works. Yeah. Uh, exterior, base of pyramid, day. Maybe we can get in by the top. Standard. You want to try? Brassard says, sure. Brassard takes out a grappling gun. gun. Ooh, so I just want to pause this. This is the grappling <laughs> gun which they use to shoot the alien out of the airlock. <laughs> um, oh, right. Yeah. So, uh, and they, and they kept that, even though they... Uh, oh, they, they, they do they use it to descend, descend into, into the, the below the, the space, space jockey, jockey as well. But I was trying to look into it, and it seems like well, grappling hooks have been around since probably well oh, the the medieval age. Uh, it's a very common way of scaling buildings, you know, especially castles and stuff. Um, very dangerous though, because someone can just lean over the side and just cut your rope, and you fall to your death. But <laughs> When it comes to the grappling gun, well, it's grapplon gun, L-O-N, here. But the grappling gun, that that's a Batman thing. That really wasn't a real thing. Um, but since then, it's weird to think that Batman's been around for... Well, actually, it's his birthday recently. He turned 90. Happy birthday, Batman. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so for almost a century now, people have been playing around with that idea of the grappling gun, and uh, to mix success, it really does not work the same way it does in, in comic books. But the concept is it's just it's become so ubiquitous in science fiction and fantasy and, and action and those sorts of things that it's almost like an EMP or uh, a phaser or any, or a laser gun. Those sorts of weapons and tools, just that everyone has them. You know, if you're James Bond, if you're Batman, everyone has them. Yeah. And, and I think everyone, everyone on the team, team at least in this alien, alien script, has one. one. Uh, because, uh, because it's the, the only way, way they'd all be able to repel, repel down, down the hole. hole. Mm. Mm. All right. So, so uh, besides, besides taking out uh, his crap and gun, and fires the hook up toward the top of the pyramid, it catches. He clips himself to the wire. Brassard says, you guys just wait down there, oh sorry, down here, till I say it's okay to come up. Technically you're correct and he's not. (laughs) (laughs) Brassard turns on the climbing device and begins to walk up the side of the pyramid. Ominous angles. (laughs) Showing Brassard climbing the pyramid, the dust blowing, the wind shrieking. Exterior top of the pyramid, day. The peak of the pyramid is in the in extreme disrepair. Brassard arrives at the top and clings to the jagged, crumbling stones. Brassard says, there's a hole at the top. 
Exterior. Exterior. Oh, oh you go. Okay. You go. It's your turn. Exterior. Exterior. Base of Pyramid Day. Standard. Can we come up? Brassard over the filter comes. No, it's too small. Only enough room for one person. I mean, y'all could get in one at a time. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, I can also do a southern accent. I'll keep that in my back pocket in case there's another character I need to voice. Um, I, I find that interesting that there is a hole at the top because with uh, real pyramids, uh, they say that they probably originally had gold at the very top. Um, that was a little, little cap. Well, the capstone. Quite a large one. But it looks like a little capstone of, of gold if you're standing down on the ground. And uh, yeah, most people... Uh, Oh, most of them were just stolen. People would climb up there and just steal that gold. Um, so, yeah, I like that idea of maybe there was something on top of this and someone's taken it. And it's, it's also, also interesting, interesting that uh, this design, design of the pyramid, pyramid obviously, obviously, that we see in, in this script is not like the one that we've seen in Prometheus. 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 Very different. They use the concepts from... Um, uh, it originated from Dune, and then it got adapted to... Alien, and it was yes. a very breast shape looking uh, structure. Because it's so I like to make it look like a uh, breast shape. So <laughs> let's just think of the woman's breast when you are climbing in it. Yeah. And it makes, and it makes sense, sense that there's a hole at the top there. Then. <laughs> True. Uh, 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 oh yes, uh, standard says, can you see anything in the hole? <laughs> Sorry. Immature. Exterior. Top of pyramid. Day. Brassard leans over and looks into the hole. He only sees blackness. Freeing one arm, he unclips his data stick from his belt, switches on the flashlight function, and shines it down into the hole. Brassard says, I can see part way down. It just goes over, sorry, it just goes down like a stovepipe. Smooth walls. I can't, I can't see, see the bottom. bottom. Light, Light won't reach. reach. Yeah. Uh, interior, bridge, day. Faust comes trotting up the steps, a questioning look on his face. Yes, what is it? Roby, Roby says, says, Jay, we've, we've got, got a problem. problem. I, was I was wondering, wondering if there was, was any way, way that you could shortcut, shortcut the repairs, repairs and give us immediate takeoff capability. capability. Why? What's wrong? Ruby, Ruby replies, replies the computer translated an alien signal, and it's kind of alarming. What do you mean? Ruby replies, it couldn't translate the whole thing, only three fra phrases. I'll just read it to you the way I got it. Ruby holds up this strip of paper. Hostile. Survival. Advise. Do not land. And looks up to the others. And that's... All I could translate. Exterior, top of Pyramid Day. Hanging from the lip of the whole brassard is unclipping gear from his belt. Standard, over, filtered. Del, you wanna. <clears throat> Del, you wanna come down? We can figure out where to go from here. Brassard replies. No, I wanna go in. <laughs> it throws me off a little bit sometimes the way. Uh, so I guess it's. Not American slang, but just the very casual way of wording things. Like, I know Australians do it as well, where we sort of drop a few words here and there, or sort of compress them. Or in the case of just saying Australian, you know, so <laughs> we, we've taken Australian and just made it Australian. Um, but yeah, like... I should have said... To... <laughs> I should have said, said, no, no I, I want, want to go, go in. in. Like, like, separate words, words instead of, I want to go, go in. in. <laughs> yeah. Um, I notice the other thing is, because I tend to lean more towards uh, British pronunciation, so I hit those consonants way too hard for either Australian or American, so if I'm doing those accents, I've got to sort of correct myself. <laughs> Which, uh, yes, behind, enough of behind the actor studio. Exterior, base of pyramid, day, standard, and Marconis, exchange a glance, standard. Okay, Dell, but just for a preliminary look around, don't unhook yourself from your cable and be out in less than 10 minutes. Exterior, top of the pyramid, day. Brassard says, right. 
right. <laughs> there are a few, you hear right used a bit in this script. Yeah, but I thought there was something that Cleem and, and Jay Faust would say because they're supposed to be Brett and Parker. But I guess, mm. I guess they kind of changed the character types as well. Yeah, I think, and this is something I had in my notes as well, that I don't think O'Bannon is that good with characters. I think he's very much a concepts man. And I think what he puts in this script, I was going to leave this for my final judgments, but I, I think we can discuss it here, that he gave us some of the most iconic moments in cinematic history, the face hugger, the chest buster, um, and, and a lot of these other concepts that end up being uh, recycled into Prometheus. However, characters are just, they're not even characters, they're just basically mouths for dialogue. And it's hard to keep track of them all, because there is no character to be had. Um, if you read the original Alien script or the early Engineer and Paradise Prometheus scripts, everyone leaps off the page. Everyone has a distinctive look, um, character traits, all of that. Uh, Dan O'Banner's script just sort of throws a bunch of names and their function on the ship. That's it. Like one character is described as not very imaginative. Oh. Okay, that really helps me visualize this character. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I am very glad that he, this did get some rewrites with people who are much better at character. And I don't think that's a problem if a writer has, you know, every writer has their strengths and weaknesses. Some are very good at um, world building and concept creation, or creature creation, and others are very good at character. I am not good with character or dialogue myself. I really need to, to work on that. Uh, consciously. Okay, where are we up to? I know it's first. Right. <laughs> um, it's okay. Um, I think it's right. You. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, okay. yeah, that was my point. That, um, yeah, so they took that word, I feel like. They went, okay, right gets used a lot. Why don't we just turn that to 11? Why don't we just make that a running gag? <laughs> and give it to a. Uh, to um, um, Brett, Brett and Parker. And give it to one or maybe two characters and make it a distinct thing that you remember, yeah. Um, so, uh, Brassard has rigged a tripod uh, across the mouth of the hole. He unspools a couple feet of wire from the device and attaches the end of it to his chest unit. He climbs over the lip and drops into the hole. He is now hanging by the wire with his head and shoulders out of the hole. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm in the, in mouth, the mouth of the, of the chimney, chimney now, now, and, and I'm, I'm starting, starting down. down. And standard, over filtered. Take care. Rasad activates the climbing unit and lowers himself down into the hole. Here in Pyramid Day. Bracing his feet against the rough stone wall of the vertical tunnel, Brassard switches on his data stick and points it down into the depths. The beam penetrates only 30 feet or so, then is lost in darkness. Oh, by the way, I have to scroll to get to this part because I'm up to that part in the script. So if you guys are at home and you've got the script, this is the part where it goes missing, I think. <laughs> Probably quite a few pages that go missing. So um, I'm just going to scroll down to that part. <laughs> what does it start it's to say? It's the last pages of what we're covering. <laughs> Okay, let's have a look. Uh... All right. Brassard says, it's noticeably warmer in here. Warm air rising from below. Which is in uh, Alien as well. Uh, I'm wondering if that's a way of incubating the the eggs, preserving them, or whatever. Yeah, maybe. Uh, he, uh, he starts, starts down, down, paying out the line, and moving down in short hops, pushing off each time with his feet. Paying is it like this? <laughs> Feeding, yeah. Yeah. Um, he stops to catch his breath. His breathing rasps loudly in his helmet. A little sunlight filters down from above. Looking up, 
he can see the mouth of the hole, a glowing spot of light. Stannard's voice comes over his earphones. Are you okay in there? Yeah, I'm okay. I haven't hit bottom yet. Definitely a column of warm air rising. It keeps the shaft clear of dust. What was that, Dell? I lost you. Do you read me? Uh, Brassard replies, Yeah, but this is hard work. Can't talk now. He kicks off and continues down. I feel like there's a part missing there. Like there should have been a bit more dialogue. But anyway... Um, <laughs> yeah, like a bit more of, hello, hello, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's fine, but I can't talk, yeah, um, mm -hmm. I feel like that may be one of those things that when adapted and performed, it comes off a bit more natural, whereas, yeah, if you're just reading for a script, I, I don't know how people honestly read scripts and then come away and go, yes, I do want to perform in this one, I, this one looks like a good one, it's very hard to imagine, uh, most scripts coming to life. <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, and, and the scripts go through a lot of development too, so even after the actor takes the script, like for example in The Predator, uh, they hired all those actors and then the emissaries and then they never got used, they even mm -hmm. shot the scenes, so. Yeah, um, and that's why I, and some people go, oh man, whoever such and such as uh, manager is, or agent is, Oh, they should fire him. It's like, well, when you read a script, you're promised one thing, and then the film can end up being something totally different. Yeah. Definitely. Just look what happened to Solo. Like, I don't blame anyone <laughs> in Solo. Like, that on paper seemed like a great idea. It's going to be this fun, comedic take. Um, and, oh, oh, they decided to go in a different direction at the last minute. Great. <laughs> I wonder what sort of tone it would have had originally. I really would have liked to see that movie. I feel like it might have been more like Shazam or something like that. Maybe a bit more of an Ant-Man. You know, something a bit more fun and light. Yeah. I would have liked it. <laughs> uh, maybe. I, I, I like Solo as it is. But yeah, I can understand that it probably would have benefited from just going hardline. Yes, this is going to be a bit of a, a light-hearted comedy. It's just okay. It's just very middle of the road. Just... <laughs> very safe. Yeah. All right. All right. So, so uh, uh, he kicks off and continues down, down. Uh, taking longer hops as he gains confidence. confidence. Pausing for a moment to regain his breath, he shines a light on his instruments. Uh, Besides, uh, says, "I am way below, below ground, ground level. level." Exterior, base of pyramid, day, standard. What did he say? I couldn't make it out. Too much interference. Uh, interior. Bridge. Day. Ruby and Hunter. Hunter. I'm getting nowhere. The whole area around the pyramid is dead to transmission. I think we should go after them. No. <laughs> no. Ruby says, We're not going anywhere. Uh, but they don't know about the translation. They could be in danger right now. <laughs> Ruby says. We can't spare the personnel. We've got minimum takeoff capability right now. That's why Chaz left us on board. Just realized I said translation instead of translation. I actually have to consciously think about doing an Australian accent now. <laughs> what a world. Anyway, um, why you chicken shit bastard is where I was up to. <laughs> Chicken, oh, let's, let's just pause it there. This is, doesn't that remind you of that section in um, Aliens where it's like, how do I get out of this chicken shit outfit? Yeah, true. I wonder if it was it's intentional. Common. Yeah, it's not a common insult or phrase, so. Yeah. Uh, Roby says, just can that crap. I'm in command here until Chaz returns, and nobody's leaving this ship. So sassy. <laughs> but not as sassy as those uh, MCU characters. <laughs> um, interior, Pyramid Day. Brassard resumes his downward climb. Suddenly, his feet lose their purchase as the walls of the shaft disappear. The tunnel has reached its end. Below him is an unfathomable cavernous space. Uh, huffing and puffing. <laughs> the tunnel's gone. 
cave or something below me. Feels like the tropics in here. Air is warm, humid. Consulting his instruments. High oxygen content, no dust. It's completely breathable. Pause that for a sec. That reminds me of the um, part in uh, Prometheus where he, um, Holloway takes off his helmet and he's just like, Ellie! <laughs> Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and I, I mean, I, I've already covered this in Prometheus, but I don't see a problem with this idea that, oh, well, it says that the air's breathable, so let's go for it. And um, we already know that whether you're wearing a helmet or not, you, you can die. So, yeah. And as someone who grew up watching things like Star Trek and Stargate, where no one really ever wore a helmet or a protective suit of any kind for me seeing both in Prometheus and especially in Alien Co- Alien Covenant's very Stargate in terms of how everyone's outfitted um yeah it just didn't occur to me I just went oh yeah that's they're walking around on a planet now I I mean I get it it's not very scientifically realistic but um neither are literal dickhead aliens so you know <laughs> It's, it's fiction. <laughs> if only people should get over that. And it's in the original yeah. script. If people have a problem with it in Prometheus, then they have a problem with Alien. As yeah, far as exactly. I'm concerned. Bite me. Oh. <laughs> I, I don't know. I finally got the idea of um, um, you know, probably the Alien Covenant poster where it's just a bunch of xenomorphs. So just, yeah, any image of lots of xenomorphs and just right underneath, bunch of dickheads. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure someone's, someone's going to get that tattooed on them. <laughs> Maybe uh, in Australia. Yeah. Oh, did I? I? I think I posted it on Instagram. The um, uh, Giga painting a friend of mine found on the side of, a, of the road from a Giga Museum, which it's pretty rad. And uh, it's got an elongated head. It's not like a penis head, but uh, yeah, it's, it's quite elongated. That's pretty cool. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, I don't know if I can switch my camera around. Uh, where can I see my camera? In Skype, please open Skype. Skype, please help. There we go. Uh, oh, I've got to unplug that and that. And do it. turn around. Oh, can we go up to the wall? I can't even see my screen anymore. <laughs> oh, there we go. It doesn't. Come on. Work with yeah, me. I can oh. see it. Oh, wow. I'm just... That's really cool. <laughs> I'm more impressed that I was able to figure out that I was facing it in the right way. Uh, <laughs> not see for a second. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, someone's just throwing that out. Finds his keepers. That's, That's really, really awesome. awesome. Love it. <laughs> um, and, and, and we're, we're up, up to page, page 49, 49, which means we're nearly up to page 50. So so we'll, we'll try to make this last a little longer for you guys out there. Um, uh, so uh, I'll continue. Um, puffing with exertion, he releases his purchase on the stone walls and begins to lower himself on power. Now he's dangling free in darkness, spinning slowly on the wire as the chest unit unwinds. Finally, his feet hit bottom. He grunts in surprise and almost loses his balance. Interior, tomb, day. Brassard is standing on a dusty stone floor, the feeble column of sunlight shining down on him from the tunnel above, around a solid darkness. He flashes his data stick around. The beam reveals that he is in a stone room. Strange hieroglyphics are carved into the walls. They have a primitive religious appearance. Sorry, words. <laughs> appearance. Yes. Row after row of pictograms stretch from floor to ceiling. Some epic history in an unknown language. Huge religious symbols dominate one wall. Space, spaced at intervals are stylized stone statues depicting grotesque monsters and half anthropoid. Anthropoid? Half. Yeah, yeah. Anthropoid, half octopus. Which, I mean, that's Cthulhu, right? <laughs> it is. It is definitely Cthulhu. 
uh, or they could be describing the face hugger, but you know, it's it's still cool because that's that's True, the inspiration. Yeah, the original design for the O'Bannon was not a concept artist, and uh, oh boy, the original design for the alien is it's messy. It's just it's too much. Um, oh yeah, I think that's, that's what, what they're, they're describing. describing. This probably but, crap monster with the, 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 the yeah. Banana. <laughs> Reminds me of um, oh god, uh, 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 what's his name from Futurama? Um, Zoidberg. <laughs> Zoidberg, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if, well, what order it came in that he was writing the script and then went, um, oh, I'm thinking it should be like kind of octopus-like, kind of humanoid. If he was thinking of Cthulhu, and then drew what he drew. Um, and oh, what was the other thing? Oh, well, don't worry about it. Yeah, so the, the hieroglyphs that it shows the life cycle of the xenomorph. Um, it's not quite the same with Prometheus, but you have the ampule room, the head room, and there is an image of a xenomorph, which is almost this instructional thing of uh, this will create this. Yeah, it's yeah, kind, it's of, kind like of like a, a recipe, recipe, right? <laughs> mm. And I think the way O'Bannon's tackled it here, it's too obvious. It's it's almost like how a child would be like, okay, so this is this thing, and here's the instructions on the wall, but we're going to do it like Egyptian hieroglyphs so it looks cool and mysterious. Like, okay, it's, 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 it's obvious. Like, I get it. <laughs> but, that's but that's the birth of the story, story right? right? You start yeah. off with yeah. simple it's, concepts. It's, and it, and it grows, it, it moves. Yeah, um, I'm, uh, oh, I could give you a bit of a, a preview of what I'm doing for Alien Day. I will be doing a uh, special, uh, exploring all the synthetics in the franchise. And Ash definitely represents a, um, a step towards sophistication. From a very straightforward plot, uh, as we continue to explore this script, you will see that it's very straightforward. It's a bunch of people encounter an alien, they fight it, the end. Whereas the inclusion of Ash makes it more complicated and sophisticated. And so, yeah, again, this is why I love to explore early iterations of the story. Mm, Definitely. All right, so we're up to the part. Uh, Brassard says, It's unbelievable. It's like some kind of tomb, some primitive religion. Hey, is anybody there? Do you read me? Stand it. Annoyed, Brassard yanks off his breathing goggles and leaves them hanging around his neck. He takes a deep breath of the wet air. Breathing goggles. <laughs> goggles, breathing. It's, it's the... Um, uh, just like, like the, the fighter, fighter pilots, pilots have, have the, the yeah, sort of like face that. mask. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is a weird way to put it. Um, <laughs> exterior, base of pyramid, late afternoon. Standard and Malconis are standing around nervously. Standard. If we don't hear from him soon, I think we better go in after him. Malconis, someone will be down in a minute. That's another thing in Prometheus. They have to deal with the constant storms and the sun rising and the sun setting really quickly. Yeah, yeah it, it seems, seems like... like well, we're, we're not, not sure, sure about, about how big the planet is in Prometheus, Prometheus. but mm. definitely yeah, there is, like, the lack, lack of light during, during the dust storm, storm, so maybe that's, that's what they, they use to simulate um, the, the small, small planet, planet in this script, script because the, the planet in, in this alien script is only 100 kilometres in diameter, which is quite small. So every... For everything is every two or four hours. They go has day and night. They would be floating. They <laughs> there would be no gravity. <laughs> uh, oh, oh uh, I think it's um, Namek is the name of the planet in Dragon Ball Z, mm -hmm. and I think it's tidally locked. So there's it nev there's no nighttime. It's constantly day. Um, and I'd love to see that more in fiction, where you've got a planet that. It comes up tangentially in like Star Wars and Star Trek and stuff, but you never really see it uh, visually that we're on a planet that it's always daytime, it's always nighttime, or they're on 
the uh, somewhere in the middle. So if you look that way, it, it's daytime. If you look that way, it's nighttime. <laughs> that would be cool. I hope they do kind of uh, come up with it soon. But I guess sometimes in service of the story, it needs to become nighttime to become scary, or it needs to become True. daytime to. Well. Uh, I've been playing around with this idea of you often hear you know, the scary music. If you hear it, you you generally associate it with with darkness, nighttime, and, and all that sort of stuff. But I think it would absolutely be possible to make a horror story in a very bright location. So I've got this setting. I've got a few different concepts. I don't know if they'll all come together or there'll be different stories. But um, the idea of this abandoned city. Um, it's just in this infinite white desert. The, the city is white to, you know, repel the heat, and it's just empty. And you've got these characters wandering through, and you're trying to figure out what happened. And I love the idea of those visuals, you know, very bright to the point that it's almost painful. And then you've got, you know, very creepy, ominous music. I think the marriage of the two would be be quite cool. And no one does this stuff. Come on, we've got. Weird planets out there, people. Use these ideas. <laughs> Especially, Especially with where they're headed for um, uh, Aragai 6. 6. Uh, I've, I've, I've had, had a guess of where, where it would be, be. And, and the, the sun, sun is going to be pretty, pretty bright, bright if mm. the planet is close to it. So <laughs> <laughs> they get there and, oh shit, it rains diamonds. We're all dead now. <laughs> but God bless so sparkly. <laughs> Maybe that's where the vampires come from. <laughs> All right. Uh, annoy. Uh, okay, okay, besides the answer is breathing goggles. Um, exterior base pyramid late afternoon. Standard and Melconis are standing around nervously. Your turn. Uh, no, we did that. Uh, and then, yeah, interior, so we're up to... Yes. Interior to late afternoon. Face. Well, midnight. It's never too soon. <laughs> Boogie man. <laughs> face bear. Brassard approaches the center of the room, which is dominated by a large, broad pedestal. On the pedestal are rows of leathery urns, or jars, exactly like the one Brassard stumbled across in the alien ship, except these are all sealed. He walks around the urns, studying them. They all have sealed lids. He shines his light on one of them, and he lays his gloved hand on it. He lifts his mask radio to his lips. I don't know if you can hear me, but this place is full of large bottles or jars, just like the one we found on the other ship, except these are all sealed. Also, they're soft to the touch. He peers more closely at the leathery object. Another funny thing, I just put my hand on it and now there are these raised areas appearing where my fingertips were. Uh, exterior, base of pyramid, day. The sun drops down below the horizon, throwing the landscape into gloom. Standard and Malconis switch on their lights. Standard. Let's go. He attaches his chest unit to the wire and starts up. Interior. Tomb. Night. Brassard is moving his light along the rows of hieroglyphs on the wall. They depict stylized drawings of strange monsters. He pauses quickly to change the film clip in his data stick. Then he turns back to the urn. He was examining, but there's now a hole in the top of it. He shines his light onto the floor at the base of the urn. There lies the lid. The stopper that had filled the hole. He picks it up and studies it. It appears more organic than artificial. The inside of the surface is spongy and irregular. Then he turns the light to the now open urn. He bends over the mouth of the urn, shining the light in. And with, and with shocking, shocking violence, violence, a small octopus-like thing leaps out and attaches itself to his face, wrapping its tentacles around his head. With a muffled scream, he launches himself backward, tearing at the thing with his hands. So, uh, I don't have a printed picture of this, but at this point, he's been attacked by something that looks like a cross between a starfish and an octopus. On his face, yeah, it looks just... like um, Starro in the DC, DC comics. It's like, it, <laughs> well, there's the big starfish, and then there's the smaller ones that get attached to your face with an eyeball on it. That's basically what it is. And I think the face hacker had uh, eyes or one eye in the novelization, if yeah. I recall correctly. Yeah, that's right. 
Uh, and I think I can see an eye or something like that in this illustration. The illustration is pretty good, actually. We'll uh, put a copy of it onto the blog so you can have a look. Okay. No, it was Star. Yep, Starro was not imagining that. That did happen. Yeah, we yeah, have we to have put, a put a copy of that one to the blog too. <laughs> yes. And it controls your mind. I also, I also wanted, wanted to point, point out that, that uh, the design of the urn is just like in Prometheus, Prometheus when we've got the urns with the black goo and the um, black ooze kind of rising up. It's kind of yeah. simulation, simulation of what they did to the eggs. They actually, actually held, held them upside, upside down, down so that the liquid would drip upwards. Ah. Uh, so, uh, so, sorry, downwards. So, so when they reverse the film, it would upwards, and they have the mm. hand of Cain reaching out. So it's all, all of this stuff has been kept in the script. It's all in the movie, but it's also revisited in a different sort of way in Prometheus, and I think it works. Mm. All right. Uh, you read the next part. Oh, yeah, I just realised, yeah, we are, uh, well, so the latest minutes of Prometheus by Minute and, and one we're about to record soon. Um, yeah, it is basically this scene. It's the face hugger scene, except it's uh, the hammer feed. But the, the intent is still the same. Yeah, it really, it really works. works. I like how uh, it's kind of the, the same but different. Yeah, I was thinking about that the other day, and I came to the realisation that, well, that's real life. You know, you could talk to, uh, let's say, a particular uh, uh, mothers. You want to know the experience of, you know, having babies, raising them, all of that. Now, you could talk to a dozen different mothers, and they'll tell you their own unique stories, and there's going to be unique aspects, but some of those major beats are going to be the same, because... Every path we go on in life, uh, whether it's parenthood or a certain career, there's a certain structure that that journey is going to follow. And so that's why I, I'm a little more relaxed with tropes and familiar structures. Because it's like, well, yeah, if you're going to go on exploring in space, what, what do you think is going to happen? There's, there's a certain system here. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's a trope, a trope that, that works, because obviously there's, there's been a lot of um, TV shows and stuff that have done homages to this or, or done something very similar to the likes of it. Mm. Uh, uh, even in, in, in modern, modern films, films they, they, they can't, can't really, really get away from, from this sort of concept, concept because it's been done, done here. here. I think the other thing is that culture evolves slowly, and if you try and jump ahead too far, you risk alienating people. So uh, one example... Um, that comes to mind that I, I've been looking into recently is that so human beings have always been seeing weird shit in the sky you know burning uh, something burning or falling or lights hovering and moving in very unnatural ways you know those sorts of things most people up until about the 1950s were claiming to see angels um, some of them would say it's just a, a meteorite or whatever a me no meteor um but after the 1950s, there's this sharp twist, and then suddenly everyone's like, it's UFOs, it's aliens, it's, U it's UFOs, it's, it's all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's never really changed since then. But then that could change again. It all It's all based on our pre-existing concepts, and movies especially do this. They are building upon our pre-existing concepts and uh, even stereotypes. And archetypes so yeah I'm not expecting I have talked about this a little bit that if there is a third alien movie I'm not expecting it to be something completely different there's got to be familiar structure there just has to be there's no way around that I like those sorts of things though um, mm. it's kind of like when you you go into a film and you're watching it and you're just waiting for one of the characters to say the title of the movie because it always happens yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I think there are definitely, especially with the Alien prequels, there are things that definitely subvert expectations and the, they do things that were not expected, but we also do need some familiar ground to build from. Mm, for sure. Mm. Alright, All right, let's, let's continue. continue. Uh, I think oh, it's I you. Think it, yeah, it's me. Uh, exterior, top of Pyramid Night, the dust 
uh, <clears throat> the dust blows and howls of Standard and Morconis arrive at the top, lights bobbing in the darkness. Standard, puffing with exertion. Here's his line. We can haul him out if there. Uh, we can haul him out of there if we have to. Malconus. It'll yank him right off his feet if he's not expecting it. The line could get tangled in something. Standard. But what can we do? He's out of the radio contact. Malconus. Maybe we should just wait a few more minutes. Standard hesitates, clinging to the lip of the hole. Standard, making up his mind. No. I told him uh, to be out in ten minutes. It's been much longer. Let's get him out of there. Standard pulls himself up and crouches and... Uh, oh, and crouches precariously on the edge of the tunnel. He begins to fiddle with the winch mechanism from which Rassar's line dangles. Standard. The line's slack. Christ, do you think the idiot unhooked himself? He, switched the winch mo he switches on the winch motor. With a whine, it begins to reel the line in. After a moment, the line tightens with a jerk. jerk. And the motor slows down, laboring under the added weight. There, it caught. Is it still coming up, or is it hooked on something? And no, it's coming. Can you see anything? Standard shines his light down into the hole. No, I can't see far enough. The line's moving, though. Uh, for, for a moment, the two men hang to the narrow top of the pyramid to save their strength, while the line reels in and the wind howls. Then Standard shines his light back down in. I can see him. Here he comes. The winch begins to labor heavily. Get ready to grab him. Brassard appears at the top of the pit, dangling limply from the wire. Standard reaches out for him, then recoils sharply. Look out! There's something on his face! Malconis attempts to come to his aid. What is it? Don't touch him! Watch it! In their panic and confusion, the men teeter momentarily, finally regain their balance. They shine their light on Brassard. He appears completely unconscious, and the octopus thing is wrapped, up around, his, uh, wrapped around his face, motionless. Oh, God. Oh, God, no. Help me, I'm going to try and get it off. With his gloved hands, Standard grasps the tentacle mess and tries to pull it from Brassard's head. It won't come. It, it's stuck. W what is it? The hell should I know? Come on, give me a hand. Let him... <clears throat> Let's get him out of here. There. Hot to zone. Take him from the top. No, I actually don't have to take him from the top because it's not recorded. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> the two men grapple with Brassard's limp body, lifting him from the hole. Interior bridge. Now, is that the end of that? Or because I'm what I'm scrolling through the. Oh, oh, oh! I'll come to you. Um, there's still more. Roby and Hunter I'll... are sitting moodily silent. There's a long moment while nothing is said. Then, I've got them. They're back on my screens. Roby leaps to his feet. How many? Three blips. They're coming this way. Roby grabs the microphone into the mic. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. We're coming back. Thank, Thank Christ. Christ. We, we thought, thought we lost, lost you. you. Listen, Listen, there's been a new development. Can't hold now. Broussard's injured. We'll need to. We'll need some help getting him into the ship. Let's pause, pause there. there. <laughs> that kind of reminds me of um, when Ledward uh, uh, is, is sick in the. the is it uh, uh, Karim, Karim is trying to get him Karim, into. Yeah. The med bay, and Faris says, like, can't talk now, or uh, whatever. I need help getting him well, into the ship. Well, I mean, it's all tying back to the original alien where Ripley doesn't want to let them back into the ship, and Ash eventually does. Um, and again, this is a scene where Ash really benefits the story. So in this script, it's just, oh, should we let them in? Should we not? Uh, uh, okay, just do it. Whereas in Alien, it's, why would they do that? Oh, it's Ash. He's got another motive. So you're adding more complexity there. Um, they got that complexity obviously isn't needed in Alien Covenant where they do, it's actually closer to what we're seeing here, where it's a ploy for empathy, where it's like, oh, he's injured, you got to help him. He's our crewmate. Don't you care? Mm, and manage to not follow the quarantine protocols at all. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the same time, follow them, but not effectively. <laughs> yeah. Sort of, but not really. Yeah. Uh, 
Roby collapses into the chair suddenly limp with apprehension. He's feared something like this all along. And now it has begun to happen, Roby, to himself. Oh, no. Uh, Jay, this is Cleve. Meet me at the main airlock. Hunter Jash is from the room. Roby remains where he is, seated at his console. He is stunned and his mind is racing. The camera moves in on his face. Interior, corridor, outside airlock, night. Hunter comes racing down the steps and hurries up to the inner lock door. He presses the wall intercom. Martin, I'm by the inner lock door. I'll wait here for you to, uh, here for you to let them in. Interior, bridge, night. Uh, Roby sits in strangely quiet. Right. Right. <laughs> Interior, corridor, outside, airlock, night. Faust comes running up, covered with grime. What the hell's going on? Don't you know, brassard has got hurt somehow. Hurt? How? He just said somehow. He didn't... <laughs> Don't know. Maybe we'll be real lucky and he'll just have broken his neck. I knew we shouldn't have come down here. Interior, bridge, night. Roby is seated alone in the room, studying the transmission from Standard and Malconis. Standard. Martin, are you in there? Uh, for those following at home, now we're up to page 49, <laughs> because we were reading from the continuation, and we've published it to the blog right now, but you will have to join later on when we've added all of our additional footnotes so you can see what we've been talking about. Uh, so, page 49 for those following at home. Uh, Roby says, here, Chaz. We're coming up now. Open the outer door lock. Chaz, Chaz what, what happened, happened to Brassard? It's some kind of organism. It's attached itself to him. Let us in. Roby does, does not, not reply. You hear me, Martin? Open the outor door. <laughs> Stop for a second. This kind of reminds me of 2001 of Space Odyssey. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. <laughs> my, um, my how just sounds like David, I think. It does. <laughs> You'll have to work on it. <laughs> sure, yes. When I do my 2001 minute. <laughs> can't wait for that. Um, so, uh, Roby replies, Chaz, if it's an organism and we let it in, the ship, the ship will be, be infected. infected. Chaz, uh, no, hang on. Uh, Standard. Oh yeah, but yeah, no. I uh, I clicked over and I clicked back again, and uh, just <laughs> read what was wrong. But I killed the tension. Sorry. <laughs> Standard. Oh, filter. Uh, we can't leave him out here. Open the door. Uh, mm -hmm. Or is that the next one? No, Sorry, no, that's the right one. That's uh, the right one. Okay. Roby, I, I scroll. <laughs> Roby replies uh, in an urgent tone. Chaz, listen to me. We've broken every rule of quarantine. If we bring that organism on board, we won't have a single layer of defense left. Martin, this is an order. Open the door. Hating it, Roby leans in forward. Uh, sorry, Roby leans forward and throws the switch. So there's, there's that lack of tension there, because it's like, oh, okay. Whatever. Yeah, it's just like, oh, I guess so. Um, I, it is more like Alien Covenant, where it's just, oh, I guess I don't want my friend to die. And uh, I guess Standard is, is the, the captain. captain. Kind of mm. outranks the executive uh, executive officer, Martin Roby. So he has to give in, but I, I guess this is just a treatment, a story outline. I think the tension yeah, comes later on. Yeah, we can forgive it for not talking about, you know, pulling rank and all those sorts of things and not getting too specific. I think that's where it all it comes down to is this is a first draft and that's why it feels very bare bones and you're missing a lot of those other things. However, I still would say that I'm not getting the impression this is someone who's very good at character. I will, I will stick by that statement. But uh, in terms of that sort of tension and, and uh, those more nuanced plot elements yeah that's obviously something that would have probably come later had O'Bannon been left to his own devices anyway uh, I just want to put in a little disclaimer to apologize to Diane O'Bannon if she does listen to or watch this uh, stream and how quite me no <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> how critical we are on Dan, but you know, we're doing this because we, we do love Alien, we love the scripts, but we also love the, the cumulative effort of everyone changing it to what it yeah, that's becomes. Absolutely what it, what it comes down to is film is a collaborative medium and yeah i think there's nothing wrong with analyzing or criticizing art especially in its early development um but yeah i mean there is no alien without dan o'bannon i think you know we, we have to give him respect for that of course <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So now, uh, for those following at home, we're on to page number 50, which is the, the end of our thrall. But we'll, we'll go through and um, discuss more. Uh, so we'll, I think it's, uh, whose turn is it next? I think it's uh, you, I guess. Um, you're saying uh, interior corridor outside airlock night. All right. Uh, interior corridor outside airlock, night. A red light goes on, on a console on the wall. The whine of a large servo is heard, followed by a solid metallic clunk. Hunter, outer doors open. After a moment they hear the motor sound again, followed by another clunk. The outer door has closed again. The red light goes off. The inner door slides open, Stand and Malcona stagger through, carrying the sagging body of Brassard. A cloud of choking dust follows them out of the lock. Standard, pulling off his mask. You men stay clear, there's a parasite on him. Hunter and Faust recoil. Hunter, oh, oh, God, oh. Is it alive? I don't know, but don't touch it. Give us a hand here, let's get him on the auto dock. Hunter and Faust move in carefully to help with the limp burden. Interior, infirmary. One of them flicks on the light as they come shuffling into the medical room carrying Brassard. Revealed in a uh, rather small cubicle, whose walls are lined with machinery, the principal item of interest is a mechanized bunk bed, which rests in a cradle and slides in and out of a slot in the wall. I have a problem with these, with this futuristic furniture that, you know, slides out of walls or comes up out of the ground. Like, okay, so you'd have a room about, like, yay big, and then you'd have walls about that thick to hide all the furniture. And like, this is, doesn't make any sense. Whereas I would love to see it. It was more like, um, uh, like a, yeah, it's how the old school bed, they fold up and just go against the wall or um, kind of that gull wing technology. I think that system works much better for safe space, future technology. What are you doing? Sorry, I've just got the package. Ah. <laughs> For those uh, who um, can see the video, uh, this is a tote bag. I am. Um, I. I come, <laughs> I'm terrible. There's a bit of lag on the video, so I'm waiting. <laughs> oh, there it is. I've copied it from um, the Alien Shorts, and I printed myself off a tote bag. So this is now my everyday bag. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> All right. Um, tote bag. Yes, tote bag. The alien 40th anniversary tote bag. The only one because I I went and got it made myself. Yeah, I have to do some screen printing. <laughs> yeah, but they don't sell that. You, 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 that's some pretty standard kind of merchandise there. Yeah, I'll, I'll suggest it to Fox, Fox but who knows whether they'll, they'll take it on. <laughs> I, I really think they should hire proper fashion designers like you and I to Yes, I mean we are stuff. So you can do the jewellery, I'll do the, do the clothes, yeah. Exactly, and I can do accessories as well, it would be great. Uh, so, uh, in this section, now that we've come to, what is it, page uh, 50, <laughs> but we're, we're heading towards a close. Um, so, uh, standard uh, goes, I don't know, don't touch it, give us a hand here, let's get him to the auto dock. It, it kind of reminds me of the chest buster scene as well, because it's saying, you know, don't touch it as well. This essentially plays out almost exactly the same as it does in the, in the final film, and that's... I always find it more interesting to see what stays rather than what changes. Because I think when they change things, you go, oh, yeah, I can kind of see why they would have done that. But when it stays, you go, oh, 
yeah, clearly this idea was just so fully formed and clear from the outset that they didn't want to mess with it. I think that it kind of... This, this script, you know how, like, uh, Walter Hill and David Jailer tried to say, no, we wrote the script. They, they, they added Ash. They changed the names. But essentially the story is exactly the same. So I can understand why Dan O'Bannon got super pissed off when they kind of tried to steal credit for his homework, basically. That is not cool. But, um, yeah, I'd say that Walter, uh, David and Walter, um, they they added all the... The writers, not the androids, by the way, people. (laughs) Yes. Um, I'd say they added those... The, the, the finer details that are very important to a story. So what we're getting from this script is the most fundamental elements of the story. You know, that uh, space truckers find a signal, go to this planet, find a space jockey, get find a spa- uh, face hugger, deal with that, chest burst a scene, um, and there's a few other uh, iconic moments after that that they're defeating the Xenomorph. And then... What Walter and David added was the the characterization and the plot twists and the all that sort of corporate uh, world building things. They're sort of making it seem bigger than it is, giving the world a bit more history. Mm. And there's obviously like the change between uh, the pyramid and the alien ship. They had to condense it all down into the one because they couldn't mm. afford for it to be two separate things anymore. But we still don't know uh, absolutely that there is, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what do we call it? <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't know that where they find the eggs is separate from the ship. We are making that assumption that it's the same thing, but when you look at the size of the ship and then you look at the cavern, I feel like the where the eggs are are a separate thing. Mm. If you get what I mean. Yeah. Anyway, um, so sorry, you you read right down to where it says uh, "rest in the cradle." Yeah. And slides in at the slot of the wall. So it's standard says one more line. Help me. Come on, yeah. let's get him up here. Uh, and, and we'll stop there because I think we've gone on for like close to two hours now. Oh my God. Good Lord. And I think I finally fixed the echo in my... Uh, apparently I've had an echo on my uh, microphone. So I had to pick between my webcam or my microphone. So it might have been doing a double feed. I apologize, people. Oh, this is right. what happens when I mess around with my settings. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, that's that's where we leave it. So what do you think about what we've covered so far in relation to Prometheus by Minute, in relation to Alien? What do you think of the story? I think it's really great to see... Yeah, yeah I kind of uh, <laughs> sprinkled my final thought throughout, but um, yeah, it, it really is great to see these ideas develop and see where it originated... I think it gives the final products more significance and especially as a Prometheus fan, it's a lot of fun to explore this script and go, oh, okay, so they've recycled a lot of these ideas that um, did O'Bannon live to see? I don't know when he died. Uh, I think it was the 90s. He he died fairly young, I think. Uh, Yeah, I don't think he got to see... Uh, Prometheus. Oh, I, think. I just missed 2009. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a shame because I, I would have loved to know what he thought of that. I mean, probably, I think, kind of like Alan Moore had seen his stories get uh, misused so many times that he probably was jaded by that point. But yeah, I think he, he might have appreciated that his idea, ideas weren't lost forever and they did find a home somewhere, even if it took 30 years. Yeah, um, and I also think that Ridley is trying to pay homage to everyone who contributed to Alien. 
Um, yeah, and he was the one who brought Giga back in because Giga was part of the project, then was fired or just let go, and then Ridley went, no, we we need Giga. This lives and dies on Giga's designs. Mm, exactly. And... I really respect... I've always gone about Ridley Scott, my dad, um, but <laughs> I just... I really do respect him in terms of he seems like such a genuine bloke. He um, really cares about other people. He, he has a good eye for talent, and he makes sure that talent gets what it deserves. Um, and and you you saw that uh, most recently with the All the Money in the World movie, where <laughs> good on him. You know, they, they didn't have to do it. The whole thing about hit my desk the whole thing about kevin spacey came out and ridley scott's like fuck him then we're gonna reach we've got oh what do we got um oh like two hours before this has to be pre- to premiere okay it was more like two weeks but yeah fine let's do it uh totally recast the role redid it um and you know made sure everyone was paid properly and all of that although there was something about mark Wahlberg being paid more but i think he didn't know about it whatever but it just seems like he's a real genuine guy and he does respect talent and so it's no surprise to me that he wanted to keep a bit of the spirit of Ban- O'Bannon alive in Prometheus. Mm. And as, as we've experienced going through some of the pages of the scripts, we definitely see some elements of that that have been either taken and used in Aliens and then used in Covenant. Mm. So, yeah, it's really great to see that some of this stuff stays alive through the films. Nothing gets wasted. Waste not, what not. Everything gets yeah. used in the Alien universe. And I hope, at least in terms of the concept art that we saw for Covenant, that we see that in a later movie because some of that stuff was really amazing. Um, and they didn't end up being used in the film. And I think it's also just very encouraging as a writer that you don't get to see early drafts of novels. That doesn't often happen. But to see early drafts of scripts, there's a lot of those, and you can look at them and just realise, oh, yeah, it's okay if your first draft of a novel or a script is bare bones, is a little bit too simplified. Uh, Because I definitely, I know that when you're, writing especially the first time around and you're in that writing mode you're just smashing stuff out you're not really thinking about refining it and you shouldn't expect to refine it in that first draft so yeah read scripts people it's very inspiring. <laughs> um i had a few other notes um yeah, the uh the, the yorick joke so there's the decapitated <laughs> space jockey head yeah. um and god that joke is so cheesy but it this it's significant of course because this idea again is reused quite significantly in Prometheus and I also I kind of like O'Bannon's approach that uh like there's a line I don't remember which character says it but they're like oh I wish we dealt with you and not the xenomorph or whatever it is you know what if we'd met the space jockeys and uh, armed with the full knowledge of Prometheus like nah it's not, not any better. safer. <laughs> no. Everything in space wants to kill you. It's like Australia, but infinite. Um, <laughs> uh, in Australia, no one can hear you scream. <laughs> and, oh, the other element that we sort of almost got back was that Holloway was going to be named Martin in the space script. He was called Martin, and Martin is one of the characters in this alien script. Sorry, I'm just replying to a message. <laughs> How dare you? Um, <laughs> the thing is, my final note was that the triangle or triangles seem to have a significance to O'Bannon personally, and I wonder what that is. I don't know whether Ridley knew what that significance could be or he, whether he had that conversation with Dan. Um, or it's something that he decided to take and kind of take the sort of ideas that Dan was manifesting together and build off that like a springboard. Mm. Um, but as you know, I've, I've got from the previous live stream that we did, I shared my um, 
possibility of where Aurigai 6 is and how it relates to Auriga 6 and how uh, the 6 could be the delta sign and therefore delta is a triangle and that's in the scripts for alien. It's a, it's a really like oh, convoluted right. way of it being related. But to me, it kind of makes sense, if that makes mm. any sense. <laughs> Yeah, I'm always looking for connections that aren't really there, so that's that's my life. <laughs> <sighs> so yeah, um, does uh, anyone who's watching still, who uh, who would like to give us some feedback or even ask us any further questions or discuss anything about the script, please come forward now or forever hold your peace. Yes. <laughs> and um, Connor, would you like to join me for the next one? Yeah. Um, we'll this has see. Been quite fun. Yeah. <laughs> Get Maybe to pull out all do... my voices. Maybe we should do like an audio drama of the original script, have someone develop it a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. You know what? There's really no reason why not. I was reading the Alien, or one of the Alien 3 scripts last night. Um, didn't need to. That's, I mean, I'm doing research on Bishop, but that's just too much of a deep dive. That was, but anyway, that's how my research goes. And I was just thinking, oh man, like we could totally, it takes no money. You know, it's just you get a bunch of friends who can do some voice acting, get someone who knows how to edit and, you know, put some special sound effects in. You could absolutely do radio plays of these alternate scripts, and I think there is a demand for it. I think a lot of people would be interested. Yeah, I think it'd be a lot of fun. Maybe we can get Michael to help us out because he's good at <laughs> he's audio so good. engineering and voices, and I can play the one character because I do not have any range. <laughs> yeah, I uh, have to wonder if he's got a Lance Henriksen in there because uh, that's a very, oh, yeah. very distinct, gravelly voice. <laughs> I can put on a man's voice, but I usually have to, you have to get me early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for some reason, everyone's voice is huskier first thing in the morning. I don't know what that is. Yeah, when people used to call in sick for work, and I used to have to have that conversation with yeah. why aren't you coming in, I'd be like, why are you coming in? <laughs> like, who am I talking to, Batman? <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds like um, Selma and Patty from uh, The Simpsons. <laughs> hey, I've got purple hair. It's just like them. Shit. <laughs> I think I look and sound like Five from the Umbrella Academy, so... Yes, uh, I saw him and I'm like, is that Connor? It, I, so honestly, weird. looking at myself on the stream right now, I'm just like, fuck. I look like him. Uh, I have ordered the costume. It should be here any day now, so I just need a mannequin girlfriend. And uh, I'm good to go. <laughs> I'm sure that'll be quite easy to find a mannequin somewhere. If not, and, someone uh, should provide one. Yeah, when I'm cosplaying, I've, I've realized like the facial expression for five just, just this sort of, uh, I'm done. I'm just, uh, why do I have to be here? Why am I talking to you people? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely the, definitely the look with the forced smile, like the, mm. Yeah, that, that sort of forced fake smile thing, yeah. Uh, um. But yeah, maybe, maybe we can continue on with this series and build it to more of a radio play. So we'll, we'll just read this one out for now, but who knows where this may go from here. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. Lots of fun. And I'm, I'm enjoying this deep dive and having a look at the series again. Like, I've printed out all of the Alien scripts because I'm a geek. And um, that's my nighttime reading. And then during <laughs> uh, every other time I'm reading a comic or a book or uh, listening to a podcast. So listening to, like, at the moment, I'm listening to AVP Galaxy from the beginning. And oh boy, their first podcast <laughs> reminds me of my first podcast. But you know, I'm so glad those guys are still doing it. It's really amazing how far everyone's come since then. Yeah, I, well, I had been podcasting uh, sort of here and there for about 10 years. Holy uh, crap. <laughs> yes, before I did... Prometheus by Minute, I had been on a few other different podcasts um, with uh, Fruitless Pursuit Network, which is still going. I don't do much on there, but I am supposed to be on that Dungeons and Drongos podcast soon. Dungeons um, and Drongos. So what it's a, it's great. It's so funny. It's a so it's D and D set in a fantasy Australia, 
um, and they'll <laughs> like there's the pie mines, and they fight uh, Mrs. Mac, and um, you there's uh, you got to stone the flaming crow. So there's flaming crows, but the only way to fight them is with stones, <laughs> and all these real esoteric Australian references. It's great, but um, they got to come up with a character for that soon. Um, so that's hosted by Luke Milton, who will be on Prometheus by Minute soon. We'll be talking about the horrendous uh, alien abortion scene in Prometheus. <laughs> that's going to be fun. So he's got like five minutes of just screaming terror. <laughs> but, oh, yes, my original point was, yeah, so I'd been doing podcasts on and off for ten years, and I'd been doing a show before that, which was horrendous. I'm not even going to mention it. I hope the website doesn't <laughs> exist. No, I was a child. I sound awful. I'm talking too fast and too high and just, mm. but that was great though, that I had this, um, sort of sandbox, a playground to make all those mistakes. So by the time I did something like Prometheus by Minute all by myself, I wasn't just like, uh, how does, how does microphone work? How does the, it's like, nah, okay, this is the microphone I need. I'm going to have a pop filter. I'm going to have these headphones. I'm going to, these are the levels I need. Da, da, da. So I mean, I still listen back to the first few episodes of Prometheus and go, eh, it's a bit quiet, or my um, my reading reading out loud, my um, sort of, uh, yeah, my, my reading out loud skills have definitely improved. Uh, I used to be a bit too monotone, but now I've, I've learned, uh, you know, tone and cadence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really good. Like, I'm still learning. I'm still stuffing up a lot of this things including mixing the sound and everything else so, like, oh don't my, look at me <laughs> yeah my best piece of advice is just read ahead you might notice when i was reading that script i paused for a bit too long so i'm actually trying to read it and really try and figure out how that should sound it's really hard to do just voice acting on its own it's a it's very much an underrated skill i think screen or stage acting is much easier because you know if you're doing a scene where oh god this guy's got a face hugger on his face and what do we do uh you can get your body moving and you're realistically breathing and reacting how you would in that situation whereas if you're just sitting here in a chair you've got to like try and make yourself breathe hard and, and all of that yeah, that's true. It's all, it's all in the training, but we'll save that for uh, for the next episode. I will, yes. I'll practice that. I think that about covers it. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, do you want to do your sign-off? <laughs> this is Coulson signing off. You can find me on travindesigns.com, T-R-A-V-I-A-N, or Prometheus by a Minute on Facebook. Oh, and Connor Coulson Prime on Instagram. Awesome. And... This is Mother of Studio Yutani, signing off. <laughs> mm.